Section 4.3, Chemical Nomenclature. Now when we say nomenclature, really we just mean naming. So we are gonna look at how to name chemicals as ionic compounds, which again, are compounds that generally contain a metal and a non-metal, covalent compounds, which are compounds that do not contain a metal, and acids, which are typically they are covalent compounds. Sometimes they could also be ionic compounds, but importantly, they have a hydrogen on the left side of the formula, and typically they are seen uh, as aqueous solutions as opposed to solids or liquids. All right, so let's start with ionic compounds, and we are gonna talk about here how we go from the formula to the name. So this is a situation where you are given the chemical formula and you are asked to provide the name. Now, ionic compounds that contain only monatomic ions. So when I say monatomic ions, I mean that they have just one type of element for the cation, which is typically a metal, and they have just one type of element for the anion, our non-metal. So for example, Ca3N2, this is an ionic compound that contains only monatomic ions because we've got one type of uh, element here for the cation and one type of element here for the anion. So when you go to name these type of compounds, first you start with a cation, so it's pretty easy. You just name the cation, the metal, as it is in the periodic table. You don't need to do any sort of name changing or no prefix or suffix changes. The cation now is always listed first in both the name and the chemical formula. Next, you name the anion, the nonmetal, from the periodic table. However, you do need to change the ending to "-ide". So for example, if your anion is oxygen, you would change this to oxide. If your anion is nitrogen, this becomes nitride. If your anion is sulfur, this becomes sulfide. So for that example we are looking at, Ca3N2, start with the cation, CAA, Ca is calcium and then N is nitrogen, which becomes nitride. So there, therefore, the name for Ca3N2 is calcium nitride. And that's all there really is to it for these ionic compounds. So let's have, a, have you try a quick, quick knowledge check question. What is the name of MGI2? Okay, correct answer here is magnesium iodide. So this is an ionic compound. It's got a metal and a non-metal. It's a monatomic ionic compound since we've just got one type of element for the cation, one type of element for the anion. So we just name the cation, the metal, as it is in the periodic table. So that would just be magnesium. So that means the answer has got to be A, B, or D. We can rule out C. Then we look at our anion. This is iodine. We're going to change that ending to ide. So magnesium iodide. You don't need to add a prefix. You don't need to add any Roman numerals here. So magnesium iodide. Okay, now let's do the reverse here. What if we need to find the charges of the ions? So if we're given the name and we are asked to generate the formula. So to write the formula of any, any ionic compound, we need to know the charges of the ions. So for example, if the name is aluminum oxide, we need to know the charge of the aluminum ion and the oxide ion. So for elements, we get this from the periodic table. Now we should know that aluminum, it has a charge of plus three because you find it in group 3A. Remember what we talked about at the end of chapter three. We should also know that oxygen has a charge of minus two when it forms an ion because it is in group 6A. So it needs to gain two electrons to have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So aluminum is plus three, oxygen is minus two. Now how do we get the formula from this? Well we can use something called the crisscross rule or I learned it as cross the charges. The charge on each ion becomes the subscript on the other ion. So for aluminum oxide, so Al3+, plus, that three becomes the subscript on oxygen and the two becomes the subscript on aluminum. This makes the formula Al2O3. So if I gave you the name Aluminum oxide, the formula you should give me is Al2O3. This is because ionic compounds are electronically neutral. The charges need to sum to zero. Okay, the sum of the charges on the cation and the anion in each formula must be zero. So if we look at this formula here, we've got two aluminum cations, each with a charge of plus three, and three oxide anions, each with a charge of minus two. So two times plus three 
plus 3 times minus 2 sums to 0. So this is a correct chemical formula. All right, let's have you try another knowledge check question. What is the formula of beryllium nitride? <laughs> okay, the correct answer is D, BE3N2. So beryllium is in group 2A, has a charge of plus two, and nitrogen is in group 5A, which means it has a charge of minus three. So when you cross the charges, you should get BE3N2. All right, now let's look at compounds containing polyatomic ions. You are going to have to memorize some polyatomic ions here. So there's a Word document with the ions you need in the, uh, this week is wrong, sorry, this PowerPoint is from my last semester. I will make sure to update the slides here. But in the chapter four folder on Blackboard, you can find a document labeled polyatomic ions to memorize and you do need to memorize these polyatomic ions these were also referenced a bit in section 3.7 i strongly recommend utilizing flashcards here so you you got to memorize these polyatomic ions you're going to need to know them for going both from the formula to the name and the reverse going from name to formula so here we're going to look at how do you go from the chemical formula to providing the name now when a polyatomic ion is part of a formula, that part of the name is just the name of the polyatomic ion. You do not change the ending to I. So that's the easy part about polyatomic ions here. So for example, let's look at the chemical formula ALPO4. So we've got aluminum is our cation, and then PO4, that is our anion. So you should know that AL is aluminum, so you just name the cation just as it is in the periodic table, just like with the previous example. Now PO4, you need to know that PO4 is phosphate. AL is aluminum, and the polyatomic ion PO4 3 minus is phosphate. So the name of this compound is simply aluminum phosphate. You just name the cation as it is in the periodic table, and you name the polyatomic ion exactly as it is. You don't need to do any suffix changing. All right, let's have you try a problem here. What is the correct systemic name of NH42Cr2O7? And you may need to use that polyatomic ion sheet to complete this problem. Okay, correct answer here is B, ammonium dichromate. So we've got two polyatomic ions. NH4 is a polyatomic ion, its name is ammonium and Cr2O7 is also a polyatomic ion whose name is dichromate. So the name of this compound is ammonium dichromate. All right, now I wanna talk about multiple polyatomic ions here. So this, I also referenced this at the end of chapter three. Now polyatomic ions, they are held together covalently and they can be thought of as a single unit that has an overall charge. So for example, PO4 free minus that phosphate polyatomic anion, it acts just like a nitride anion were. So even though these atoms are bonded together covalently, together they act as a single unit that has an overall charge. Now sometimes more than one polyatomic ion is needed to make a compound neutral. Parentheses are used around the polyatomic ion to indicate how many there are. So for example, Mg3PO42 this means we have two phosphate anions. All right, now let's look at the reverse direction here, going from the name to the formula. To write the formula of any ionic compound, we need to know the charges of the ions. So if the name is calcium phosphate, we need to, need, we need to know the charges of the calcium ion and the phosphate ion. Now we should know that calcium is plus two because it is in group 2A on the periodic table. We should also know that phosphate is minus three. We should have phosphate memorized because that is the superscript charge in the list of polyatomic ions, PO4, three minus. So we've got Ca, two plus, and we've got PO4, three minus. So we can use that crisscross rule or the cross the charges rule again. We cross the two down onto phosphate, we cross the three down onto calcium. And it's important to know here that if you're crossing a two or a three or whatever it is onto a polyatomic ion, 
that super or that subscript, excuse me, needs to go outside parentheses. So CA3 parentheses PO4 2 is the correct answer here. This is the chemical formula of calcium phosphates. All right, what is the formula of calcium hydroxide? So quick knowledge check question for you. What is the formula of calcium hydroxide? All right, the correct answer here is C. So again, we've got calcium, which is in group 2A. Its charge is plus two. And we've got hydroxide, which is OH minus. So the polyatomic ion hydroxide is OH minus. So when you do the crisscross rule or you cross the charges, you should get CaOH2 as the correct answer. Okay, last group here in the ionic compounds. These are compounds that contain a metal ion with a variable charge. So we're going from formula to name here. So some metals can have different charges depending on what they are bonding with. These will almost always be transition metals. However, there are a couple post-transition metals as well, which are under the stair step of metalloids. Because these metals have a variable charge, it is necessary to specify the charge on the metal when writing the name of the compound. So for example, potassium or calcium, you know, potassium in group one, calcium in group two. Potassium is always plus one, doesn't matter what it's bonding with. Calcium is always plus two, doesn't matter what it's bonding with. But something like copper or something like lead these metal ions have variable charges. So copper, sometimes copper is plus one, sometimes copper is plus two, or lead, sometimes it's plus two, sometimes it's plus four. It depends on what it's bonding with. So we need to specify what its charge is using Roman numerals in parentheses after the name of the metal. So if you're given the formula, you can figure out the charge of a transition metal based on what it is bonding to and how many it is bonding to. If there is more than one metal ion, the subscript is greater than one, the Roman numeral in parentheses must be the charge on one of the metal atoms. So you do not describe how many of the metal atoms there are, you must give the charge on one of the metal atoms. Let's look at an example. Suppose I gave you the formula Fe3PO42 and I asked you to give me the name. Well, we don't know what iron's charge is right now. Iron's a transition metal and has a variable charge. So we need to figure out what its charge is. So we're gonna start with the anion. The anion here is phosphate. We know that phosphate has a charge of minus three. There are two phosphate anions here. So we have a total charge contribution of negative six coming from those two phosphate anions. Now we also know that ionic compounds, they must be neutral. So since we have a total charge of minus six coming from the phosphates, we must have plus six coming from the irons. So we know there are three iron atoms here. So each must be contributing a plus two charge, right? We, we have a total of plus six from those iron ions. There are three of them. So each iron ion is contributing a plus two charge. Therefore, the name for Fe3PO42 is iron two phosphate. So the charge on each iron atom is given in parentheses in Roman numerals. Iron two phosphate is the correct answer. The Roman numeral is the charge, not the number of atoms. If you said iron three phosphate here, that would be incorrect. Iron two phosphate is the correct answer. Okay, let's have, a, try, have you try a knowledge check question. What is the correct systemic name of FEO? All right, correct answer here is C, iron two oxide. So oxygen is minus two, and there's only one oxygen anion. So we know that that iron atom there must be, have a charge of plus two, which makes the correct answer iron two oxide. All right, finally, let's look at these, these variable charges going from name to formula. To write the formula of an ionic compound, we need to know the charges of the ions. Now this is a bit easier because for example, if the name is manganese two bromide, well now we know that manganese is plus two because that charge is given to us in Roman numerals. And then we should be able to figure out, well, bromide, bromide comes from bromine and bromide is minus one because it is in group seven A. So now we just use the crisscross rule. 
MN2 plus, we cross that two over, and then BR minus one, we cross that one over. So this gives the chemical formula MNBR2. So manganese two bromide would have the formula MNBR2. Remember that ionic compounds, they have to be electronically neutral. Okay, one more knowledge check question. What is the formula for lead four sulfide? Okay, correct answer here is D, PBS2. So we've got lead, which is PB, and here it's plus four, and then we've got sulfide, which is minus two. So when you cross the charges, you may have come up with this answer, PB2S4, but you want to reduce that. You wanna reduce that down to PBS2. So PBS2 is the correct answer here. Okay, so to summarize, with ionic nomenclature, Remember that ionic compounds, generally they contain metals and non-metals. They may contain polyatomic ions as well. Metal forms, if, if you have a situation where the metal forms one type of ion only, you give the name of the cation and then the base name of the anion plus ide, plus ide. If it's a polyatomic ion, you just list the polyatomic ion. If the metal forms more than one type of ion, you name the name of the cation metal. Then you need the charge of that cation in Roman numerals in parentheses and finally, the base name of the anion, or the nonmetal, plus ide. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and split this video into two parts, so this section is a bit longer. So I'll see you in the second half when we talk about uh, the nomenclature of covalent compounds and of acids.